us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Hi everyone, my name is Bill and I serve with the Freedom Groups here at Connection. If you're new here, right now is a time where we transition into a time of giving. But before we do that, I want to show everybody something. Check this out. This photo was taken last week during one of our services. These students are serving their hearts out and it amazes me to see what they're doing. I wanted you to see it because your generosity in support of this ministry is doing good things. Together we're making a difference in the lives of many. Your generosity is why these everyday moments in ministry are possible. You can give through our church app or by mailing your gift to the address shown on the screen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this offering. We thank you that you supply our needs according to your riches and glory. And I speak blessings on every person that's involved in giving in our church. In Jesus' name, amen.
was lost, but he brought me all his love for me. All his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free.
Hi, my name is Zach, and I serve on the Connect Students team here at Connection Church. Church family, I, I want you to take a moment and just consider who you're inviting to join you for Easter at Connection. Did you know that most people are just waiting on an invitation from their friends and, and family? So okay, I, I, let's, let's get a little more in, intentional about the power of our invitation. Consider who in your life is far from God that you love so much and, and you want to introduce them to a real relationship with Jesus. Maybe a few people made your list, and, and we call this our Know Jesus list. Let us, let us come alongside you and help you pray for those people in your life. Visit ConnectionChurch.life to submit your list for prayer and for scripture references to help you pray as you're taking steps to make the invitation. On Easter Sunday, Connect Kids is hosting an Easter celebration big enough for the whole family. Easter Jam 2021 is a fun, interactive experience with games, music, and an Easter story the entire family will enjoy. There are a few items you will need to have the best experience at home, so please take a look at our supply list and grab the things that you may not have on hand. Save the day and come celebrate the greatest moment in history streaming online Easter Sunday at noon. Before we wrap up today, be sure to head over to the community page and find the Easter bingo card. Now this is a fun way to make invites to Easter and win free Connection Church gear. And all you do is fill in your spaces and share a photo on social media using the hashtag Easter Bingo and you'll receive your free gear in the mail. Thank you so much for joining us. Today is the second part of our series, There's Room at the Table. If you missed last Sunday, be sure to check it out on our YouTube channel or through the Connection Church app. But it's my pleasure to share the Word of God with you today. We've all made all kinds of excuses about all kinds of things to all kinds of people, including God. When I was a freshman in high school, I made a commitment to my band director, who was a brand new teacher to our school and community. I told him that I would give him four years with the band and help him lay a new foundation with this struggling program. By the time my senior year rolled around, I was tired of the work and the struggle of rebuilding with a group of students who resisted him year after year. It just wasn't enjoyable, and he had the foresight to know that it would be a difficult four years. That's why he asked me for the commitment up front. Well, needless to say, I wanted out. Everything in me was just saying, it's your senior year, just be selfish and do what you want. I searched and searched for my excuse, and I landed on two excuses instead of one. I ended up telling my director that my schedule was just too full to give it my all, and that I really needed to focus on my vocals in my senior year. I don't know who I thought I was kidding. It was the lamest excuse to break my commitment. I wish I could say that's the only excuses I've ever made in life, but I've gotten older and even better with excuse making as time has passed. Honestly though, people see through excuses easily and God certainly sees through every whiff of an excuse that we make. Open your Bibles and let's look at the key text of our series together. Luke chapter 14 verses 16 through 20 says, Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who have been invited, come for everything is now ready but they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. This parable is also recorded in Matthew chapter 22 and gives us the added insight that this was a king who was throwing the banquet. The king prepared a great banquet, a lavish feast, where he would have spared no expenses. If you can imagine the best food, the best drinks, unbelievable decor and atmosphere, and the king would have had servants that were tending to every need that every guest would have ever had. This would have been an unbelievable table to be at. And the whole reason that the king has this feast is because he wanted to share it with people. The king invites people to be at his table. Verse number 16 says he invited many guests. And verse 17 speaks of those who had, who had been invited. 
The king invites people to gather at his table because he wants them to share in his feast. In this culture, there would have in fact been two invitations. The initial invitation would have been the save the date that lets them know that they've been invited to the feast. And the second invitation would come when the table was ready. These guests in the parable that we are looking at initially, they RSVP that they would attend when they received the initial invitation. So these people checked the box and sent word back that they would be there. But when the second invitation comes to, that the table is actually ready, they don't take their seat. I know the proper context here. The proper deduction is that Jesus is referencing the Jews, but I believe there's another important parallel for us as Gentiles as well. And it's this. The invitation to the king's table isn't a single isolated event. I think there's many of us who initially RSVP that we would sit at Jesus' table. But now, after we're saved and Jesus is inviting us to fellowship with him, we've got other things to do. We prayed a prayer and we said, yes, I'll follow you. We gave our life to Christ. We got saved. We saved the date for heaven, but now the Holy Spirit is saying, come to the table, not just once, but again. Come to the table again and again and again. Take a seat and fellowship with Jesus. Not just pray a prayer one time, but live in relationship with him. Live in fellowship with Christ. Take a seat at the table and spend some time with him. Get to know Jesus personally. And we're saying, now I've got other things to do. You need to know that you're not invited to the king's table just once. But over and over, we're beckoned by the Spirit of God to the table of fellowship and to feast on the goodness of God. Revelation chapter 3 captures a letter that Jesus wrote and sent to Christians in a church in a town called Laodicea. Revelation 3 verse 20 says, Again, this is Jesus speaking. He says, Behold, I'm standing at the door knocking. If your heart is open to hear my voice and you open the door within, I will come into you and feast with you, and you will feast with me. Again, this letter is from Jesus to Christians, and he's saying, I'm knocking at the door, and I want to feast with you. The word feast is the Greek word deepnon, and it means the evening meal. During the time that Jesus is sending this letter in the Greek culture, they would have had three meals in their time, in their culture, just like we do, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Breakfast was something that was small and eaten on the go. Lunch would have been a meal that they would have taken with them and had sitting on the side of the road or in the hurriedness of the day. But the evening meal, now that was a feast. It was enjoyed after everyone was home and the work day was finished and you went around the table with your family. The evening meal was a time where there was no rush, no hurry, nowhere else to be and nowhere, uh, nothing else to do but enjoy great food and great company. And when Jesus said, I want to come in and feast with you, there's a reason why of all the three meals of that culture, Jesus chose to save the date on the evening meal. He's saying, I want the evening meal with you. Not the hurry as fast as you can breakfast, but the evening meal. Jesus is saying, I want to sit at the table with you, not just one time, not just at salvation, but I want to sit at the table with you over and over again. He wants to enjoy your fellowship, and he wants you to enjoy his fellowship. So what could this look like practically for us? What could it look like practically for you to accept Jesus' invitation to sit at the table and feast with him not just once, but over and over again. I think it might look like slowing down, maybe turning your devices off, tuning things out and tuning God in to spend some real time in the presence of God. Maybe it would mean that you make it a priority to be in God's house, whether that's virtually or in person. Maybe it would mean that you make it a priority to be in a connect group, have a time of worship at home, and at home, make more space in your life for the presence of God and for the Word of God. You may have sat at the table and been in His presence and feasted on His daily bread some time ago, but He has something fresh for you today. What if I told you we've become content to live on spiritual fast food when Jesus has a feast just waiting for us? 
We're living on quick prayers, Facebook posted scriptures, once in a while church and connect groups if there's nothing else going on. Honestly, it's spiritual fast food. See, just like the people in Jesus' parable, we have some common excuses for why we don't sit at the table with Jesus. We're going to look at these three excuses that Jesus outlined in his parable in reverse order that they were listed and see how they relate to the excuses that we've come to live with and hide behind. The first excuse that I want us to see is actually the last excuse that Jesus listed, and it's the exclusive people. Verse number 20, the parable said, still another said, I just got married, and so I can't come to the table. This looks like the invitation is, hey, are you coming to the table? It's all set. The feast is ready. It's going to be amazing. Everything is prepared. Just come to the table. Are you coming to the table? And he says, oh, I would, but there's this person that needs me. A common excuse for why we don't spend time at the table with Jesus is I've got these people to take care of. I completely understand that. We say things like, I can't do connect groups. I've got people to take care of. I can't have personal private time with God. I've got people to take care of. I can't serve on teams at church. I've got all these kids. I've got family. I've got responsibilities. I have people that need me. I have people to take care of. And it's not false. It's not imaginary. It's true. It's real. But could it be that it's an excuse? And I want to tell you, it's not new. It's not new that we allow people to be the reason that we don't sit at the table with Jesus. Luke chapter 10, verse 28 says that Jesus and the disciples continued on their journey. They came to a village where a woman welcomed Jesus into her home, and her name was Martha, and she had a sister named Mary. Mary sat down tentatively before the master, absorbing every revelation that he shared. But Martha became exasperated by finishing the numerous household chores in preparation for her guests. So she interrupted Jesus and said, Lord, don't you think it's unfair that my sister left me to do all the work by myself? You should tell her to get up and help me. The Lord answered her, Martha, my beloved Martha, why are you upset and troubled, pulled away by all these many distractions? Are they really that important? Mary has discovered the one thing most important by choosing to sit at my feet. She is undistracted. What a word. And I won't take this privilege from her. Mary chose to be at the table with Jesus. Martha's saying, I would, but I've got all this other stuff to do. And it's presented as though it's a choice that it's an either or. Take care of all this stuff or be at the table with Jesus. Yes, you have kids. You have a husband. Yes, you have a wife to take care of. Yes, you are a caregiver. Yes, you have at-risk people in your family. Yes, you have people who need you. But what they really need is a mom who spent some time at the table. What they really need is a husband who spent some time at the table. What they really need is a wife who spent time at the table. The people that are in our care aren't going to benefit from us being distant from Jesus' table. They won't benefit from us being exhausted or being joyless. They're not going to benefit from us being full of anger and resentment. They're not going to benefit from us living in delusion or in despair. But they are going to benefit from us living from the presence of God. The second excuse that we see in Jesus' parable is money. Verse 19, another said, I just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out, so please excuse me. Now, you might glaze over that, but what it really means when it says five yoke of oxen, that's actually ten ox. One man can only walk with one yoke of oxen at a time. So this tells us that this person is a well-to-do man who would have had employees walking behind those five yoke of oxen. In fact, Matthew 22 verse 5 in the parallel presentation of this parable says that one went off to his business. He's literally letting money keep him from coming to the table. Why do we let money keep us from coming to the table? Well, I think there's three big reasons. First of all, we think I need to make more money. 
The invitation to come to the table of the Lord to fellowship with Him never comes at a convenient time when we are doing nothing. But the invitation is something that we have to clear our schedule for. We feel so driven to make more money. So we work extra hours, we work harder, we work longer, we work more, we take uh, weekends, we take part-time, we'll take extra work, and we fill our life to the margins just to make more money. And that's what this man is saying. I need to work more. And we're filling our life with activity so that there's no time for the table. The second reason that we let money keep us from the table is we say, I've got to spend my money. What good is it to make money if we don't enjoy money? So we spend our time buying and playing with toys. We make money so we can spend the money. If I'm not making money, I want to be spending my money. I want to go places on my off time and try to fill my tank up and buy things and enjoy what I've bought. The third reason we let money keep us from the table is simply, I don't want to give my money. Time with Jesus may lead me to give him some of my money, and I don't want to do that, so I stay away from time with Jesus. I don't want him to press on my heart. I don't want him to call me out on the greed that's in my heart. I don't want him to call out the lack of trust that I have for him in the areas of money. So I stay away from the time with Jesus because time with him may lead me to give money. Mark chapter 4 verse 18 says, Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. 2,000 years ago, Jesus said that some of us are like soil, that when we hear the word, it gets choked out. The word of God gets choked out simply because of money. Don't let that be you. The third excuse that we see today is actually the first one that Jesus described, and he says in verse number 18, they all alike begin to make excuses, and the first said, I just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Now that may make sense until you realize that feasts of this nature are happening at nighttime. <laughs> you don't go and look at a farm after you bought it. And you certainly don't go and inspect it and look at it at night. No one does that, not even today. No one does that. You don't say, I'm just going to go look at this house. I'm going to go look at this piece of property at night. Here's what he's really saying. The world is on my mind. I know I RSVP'd that I'd follow you and that I'd come to the table, but the world is on my mind. He's saying, I'll come to the table later I've got other things on my mind. I have worldly things, carnal things, non-spiritual things on my mind. And I'll come to the table. I'll get there eventually. I just have other things that I want to go and do first. I'll come to the table when the weather changes. After winter's over, I'll come to the table. Maybe after travel sports are over, I'll get to the table. After the kids get back in school, I'll come to the table. After UK season is over, I'll come to the table. After hunting season is over, I'll come to the table. After spring break, after summer vacation, maybe after COVID is over, I'll come to the table when life is not so crazy. We will come to the table. Win, win, win. Billy Sunday said, an excuse is the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. The Apostle Peter had the, had the world on his mind. He denied that he knew Jesus three separate times. And then Jesus resurrected. John 21 verse 4 says, At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, Fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. But he said, Throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple that Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work. He jumped in the water and headed to the shore. The others stayed in the boat and pulled the, load net, the loaded net to the shore, where there were only about 100 yards from the shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooked over a charcoal fire and some bread. 
Bring some of the fish you've just caught. Jesus said this. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore, and there were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. Look at that. Jesus prepared a table yet again. And Jesus is saying, Pete, I know you've been distracted, but come to the table again. I know you got it wrong three separate times, three times in a row, but come to the table. Again, I know you've been distant from me, but come to the table again. So let me say to you today, whatever your excuse has been, maybe it's been people, maybe it's been money, maybe it's just been the world. Jesus is inviting you to the table again. However long you've been distracted, however long you've been distant and disconnected, Jesus is inviting you to the table again. Let's pray. Lord, we invite you into this moment to tear away every distraction that is standing between us and time with you. We admit right now that excuses are lies. The real enemy of time with you is our wandering hearts. And Lord, we turn right now back to intentional and purposeful time spent with you. As we do, Lord, please stir up our passion and reignite our desire to commune with you. We repent from blowing off the invitations. We repent for not recognizing your gentle nudges. And we ask that you make the invitation again to come and dine, to come and sit at the table with you.